Restoration of Whitehaven is being brought to you by a special grant from the Kentucky Humanities Council. And we have a whole committee of people here today uh, to talk about the restoration project of Whitehaven. And uh, we're providing this history and background and the plan, the architectural plans of the restoration project uh, to involve you, the viewer, to ask questions, anything that may be rolling around in your mind concerning the, the, the structure, the restoration project that's going on in Whitehaven. Uh, tonight is your opportunity to give us a call here at Paducah 2, and we have secretaries waiting to jot down your messages, and as soon as we've seen the, uh, the program uh, dealing with the history and the restoration plans, well, then our committee will be here to respond directly to you and any questions that you might have concerning this project. And it's a way of involving the community at the outset with the project that's going to be going on at the uh, corner of Lone Oak Road and I-24 for the next uh, 10, 12 months, perhaps. And so uh, I'm very excited about the project, and I hope that you have pen in hand and uh, will take down the number 443-0266 and give us a call sometime within the next half hour. And I hope that you people on the panel will enjoy uh, seeing what Bob Johnson has put together on this uh, uh, historical perspective of Whitehaven. And so to start our program off, if those of you at home are ready, let's look at the tape of the restoration project of Whitehaven. And while we're waiting, give us a call here at Paducah 2, 443-0266. Above Interstate 24 in Paducah stands Whitehaven. Now only a pile of brick and plaster. It is a landmark, a landmark cherished by the people of Western Kentucky. A grand mansion, once doomed because of neglect, it is now destined to be saved for a new and exciting future. Well, the uniqueness of it is that there is virtually no other uh, tourist information and welcome center of this nature anywhere in the South. Uh, it uh, is uh, so very special from that standpoint, this uh, beautiful uh, antebellum home there is uh, throughout the nation uh, a craving for a restoration, a craving for a preservation, a, an appreciation of that which we had in the past, uh, the values, the lifestyles, and I think that uh, we are capitalizing on that and will be benefiting by that nostalgia craze, if you will, uh, that is uh, permeating uh, our society today. And uh, I think that it will uh, attract people for that reason and, and the beauty. Most uh, tourist uh, information and welcome centers are merely cracker box type installations set on the side of the road and an individual goes in and they can uh, get information, they can uh, avail themselves of the facilities there, but they're all, while they're clean, they're sterile, they're well kept, they're well run in uh, many, many places, uh, they're pretty much a stereotype, they're pretty much the same sort of thing. and. There is also a um, realization nowadays that the traveler, many travelers, uh, do not, in fact, use information centers uh, to the extent that they formerly did, but simply because if they get their information in advance and they know where they're going and, and they don't stop at these attractions, uh, or these places that are uh, intended to be attractions that are just pretty much standard and uniform. But now you take an installation, uh, uh, preservation or restoration effort like that of the uh, White Haven, and it is going to be uh, very different, very special. And there are really only a few of these antebellum homes um, left throughout the entire nation. And we have one of them right there in Paducah, 150 feet from I-24, and uh, it's it's a natural, and and it's going to attract uh, people that uh, the uh, usual, the average, the uh, conventional type a tourist uh, welcome center does not attract. The main brick portion of the house was built in the 1860s by Edward Anderson. At that time, it was a rather plain two-story brick farmhouse. After Anderson's death in 1872, the land was divided among his children, and the tract with the house on it went to Mary E. Anderson. The house remained in the Anderson family until 1903, when it was sold to Ed L. Atkins, a cashier at the American German Bank. Mr. Atkins commissioned his good friend, A. L. Lassiter, 
to do a complete remodeling of the house. Mr. Lassiter was a Paducah architect who designed such buildings as the Carnegie Library, the Senate Hotel, and the Fisher Mansion. This was a period when the classical revival architecture was very popular, and it was common practice to take a Victorian house and dress it up with columns and classic details. Lassiter added the Corinthian columned front porch, the elaborate interior ceiling plaster work, and the classically detailed front doorway. Mr. Atkins named his new home White Haven. In 1907, the house was purchased by James P. Smith, who was then mayor of Paducah. The house was renamed Bidewee, Scotch for come rest a while. Mrs. Smith, my mother-in-law, she was the dearest person. She told me that one day Mr. Smith came home and he said, you know, he called her Nell. You know, Nell, I'm tired of living downtown. This was down in the old Smith home where on the square which the city hall now sits. And he said, I am so tired of all these children and all these flies, and I am moving to the country, and I think I found the place. And that's why he took them there. Talking about, I love talking about Mrs. Smith. <laughs> she was adorable. Um, Mrs. Smith was one of the most generous people I think I've ever known in my life. She treated me, and Mr. Smith also, just they treated me just like I was their very own daughter, really, from the minute I entered their home as Richard's wife. And uh, she... Her, she was just one of those people that had to be doing for other people all the time. That was her, that's her happiness, you know. Her mother came from Scotland, and she married Mrs. Smith's father, who was an Illinois, and he served as the Secretary of State on the cabinet of President Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So you see, living in Galconda, this was her home, she had a very wonderful life. She had a wonderful life. She really did. Beautiful entertainment and social affairs and she truly knew how to entertain. She was raised with this and had beautiful parties at Bidewe. The Smiths hired Marshall Fields of Chicago to do the interior decorating of the house. Silk wall paper, heavy damask draperies were added to the interior. Several bedrooms were added to the rear of the house for the Smith's six children. A playroom with beautiful oriental stenciling was added on the third floor, and a carport was added to the side of the house. Mrs. Smith and her daughter, Elizabeth Smith Shelton, were enthusiastic gardeners. Extensive formal gardens were laid out around the house, and the Smiths had beautiful garden parties here. Elizabeth Smith Shelton was the last member of the Smith family to live in the house. She left in 1968 when the family believed that the house would be torn down due to the construction of Interstate 24. Although the house was not torn down, it was left empty and a great deal of vandalism took place. All of the original stained glass was removed or stolen. Mirrors were destroyed and most of the windows and doors were broken. Recently, concern about the future of the house prompted local citizens to take an active interest in saving Whitehaven. In 1981, the Smith family sold the house and property to Paducah Community College. Then, money became available for the construction of a tourist welcome center for Kentucky. And most important, Secretary of Transportation Frank Metz and Governor John Y. Brown gave their support to restore the Smith Mansion for the Tourist Welcome Center. These three events reversed the deterioration and restoration of Whitehaven into a tourist center will be completed next June. Architect Pat Kerr 
and contractor Bill Black have taken a more than professional interest in Whitehaven, taking frequent trips to the mansion with preservation planner Dick Holland. Is that some of the handmade brick? I think it is. Uh, it, I started to say it looks like an interior brick because it's orange, but it seems to have some paint there. Mm -hmm. You know, you had mentioned once before the difference in color of mortar between that and what you say, like fine downtown, it's a yellow mortar. Uh, what's, is there any significance to that either? Um, I would surmise that this sand for this mortar came from the creek right down on the other side of this house. Mm -hmm. It made sense. Yeah. Uh, and that downtown where our lime mortar tends to be very white, in the buildings, mm -hmm. like in the area of your office on 2nd Street. Uh, I would imagine that the, the sand for that mortar came from yeah, the river. Came from the river. Were all of the, the uh, were all of the bricks interior and exterior of this building handmade? Uh, the, the, I would assume that the oldest original construction of the building was made of handmade bricks that were made on this site, and in fact, uh, Dick has some evidence to that effect, don't you? The pit's supposed to be on the boundary, the pit where they dug up the clay and made the bricks. And it was still there like in the 1940s and 50s because the Smiths had a, Mrs. Smith and Miss Shelton had a guard there, a rock guard. So, uh, you haven't well, found that yet? No, um, I think we could find that area though. That I think um, one, still possible to find a depression yeah. in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, now there are some bricks on oh, this one here. Um, that are obviously of a later nature that I would assume were not made on this site, and in fact may not have even been made in Paducah. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, Pat, you'd they, be more familiar with this than I. Uh, well, I would. Is it a poured brick? Or? Yes, I would say it's a molded brick, right. just the way the others are. You might tell us about. It. This is uh, this is a corner off one of the interior mantles, and th there is one one particular mantle in there, one particular fireplace that is all hand molded brick. We think that the majority of the brick are there. They've fallen down through the floor and they're in the crawl space. And we think the majority of them are there and that we can repair those that, uh, that have been broken. Uh, if not, we do have an allowance in the contract that we, we have to hand make some Duplicate. special bricks we can. So, uh, but I think we can, I think we can yeah. find most of them. Now, would you say that this type brick that is in those mantles, those decorative brick, would you say that they were introduced in the early 20th century remodeling, or do you think that they were no, I think prior they were, to that? I think they were with the remodel. With the remodel. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I don't really have any... That would be my assumption mm -hmm. too, but I don't, uh, I don't have any evidence. In fact, I think that originally, before the remodeling, you know, the, the structure itself was a very simple, straight up and down two-story farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then after the remodeling, then I think is when all of the dental work and, and so on was done. There's some stained glass here that the house didn't really have that much stained glass in it. Uh, it had some insert panels uh, of stained glass that were inlaid or were the centerpieces of a larger panel that made up the two side lights of the front door, the two side lights of the upper balcony doors. And then there was a couple of places on the interior that had uh, some stained glass. But that is a craft that has certainly come back, you know, in the last 10 years especially. And I think we can just identically uh, reproduce what uh, what was there. This is a we got enough pieces to know the thickness, the bevel, uh, the type of lead, the width of the uh, uh, the width of the glazing bead, and uh, we've got enough detail and enough suppliers that uh, you know we should be able to do it yeah. exactly like it was. Now, um, the stained glass above the front doorway read by the way. And then I believe um, the stained glass on the stairway landing read Whitehaven. I think right. there was a date on it. I think it read 1903. Right. So um, that was probably when that was added. It was probably originally that stairway landing was a window that looked out over the yard. And then when they added some of the back rooms, they just put bevel glass or mirrors into it to, to cover it up. Yeah, there was a variety of glazing materials in there. You know, we had bevel glass, we had stained glass, uh, we had uh, mirrors. mirrors, beveled mirrors, you know, just uh, a variety of glazing materials. These, we don't know where they were, this pattern and color yeah. and so forth, we don't know where they were. From the photographs, we can come pretty close to the color, I'm not sure of the texture. Yeah. I was saying that um, the Smiths in their 
they had a family dining room in the room behind the stairway, and the chandelier in it was a tiff Tiffany light with multicolored glass. And the light would shine up through the chandelier, through the bevel glass of the stairway landing, create light patterns oh, all over the room. That was interesting. That was beautiful. Dick, I remember the rather green stained glass that was in the stair landing. Uh, the stained glass with yeah. lead came in. Uh, had the date 1903 in it. Uh, and someone had once told me it was from the World's Fair. Is that, oh, I never heard um, that. documented or? Oh, okay, maybe I never heard a, that either. It may be a myth, um, but I, I do know that many things were used. Yeah. Uh, from, I've, um, in the River Lore Mansion in Cairo, they had a door, a leaded glass bevel door that was from the World's Fair. Hmm. Kimmel Place has furniture that they brought back from some World's Fair. Um, this mm -hmm. intricate carved Chinese furniture that they got. Speaking of furniture, Dick, is there some uh, uh, evidence that there are some furnishings here and there and around mm -hmm. that that may be uh, put back originally? Well, the, um, the, there's everybody's heard about the piano up on the third floor, a very large square piano. Now we believe that this um, the Smiths added the um, little children's playroom on the third floor later. And so the story I've always heard, they had to put the piano in first and then build the room over on the windows or something. And then when the Smiths moved out, they left it there and then it was taken out and um, sold to a lady in New Orleans who had it completely redone. And when she heard about our the restoration effort, she offered to donate it back as a gift. Ooh, so um, it'll, and one of the rooms we'll be restoring as a um, like a museum room is the old music room, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um, it'll be well, good. Fit perfectly. Yeah, be nice. We're we're basically on the interiors, putting back uh, the form of the space, the detail, and we'll end up with it being white. From that point on, I think there'll probably be some committees. This is what I'm told. There'll probably be some committees who will come in uh, to do what we would term interior decorating. If there are any area rugs, uh, carpeting, uh, drapes, that sort of thing. I think it'll be done by committee, which is, uh, should be interesting. And at that time, it would be very appropriate for citizens who wanted to donate artifacts or furniture yes, or yeah. pieces from this, yes. from Whitehaven to do so. Yes. Well, to be incorporated in that interior design. The benches that were in the front, they had two benches built into the wall in the front hallway were taken out, and the um, guy who has those wants to give them back, too. Yeah. And Jerry Smith was telling me that she remembers how they were covered. And that's where she and uh, Mrs. Smith would sit in the morning waiting for Mr. Smith to come down to go to work. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Smith would say goodbye, and Jerry would often ride with them downtown. Yeah. So we have some good documentation. Speaking on. of the interior, let's go ahead and take a look. You want to? Great. your Taken by A.L. Laster in 1903 after the remodeling, standing like at the front door, shooting this way. And the furnishings we had a, a hall tree and a potted plant and a couch and a easel with a photograph there. And it wasn't real fancy, but that's what yeah. had it had. This, uh, now, this stairway, would you attribute to the A.L. Lasseter remodeling yeah, design? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, the picture yeah. shows. Mm -hmm. uh, is, do you have any idea what the 1860 design was? No, the stairway? Not really. Probably anything that gives a clue. Why would it just run 
It may very well have been the same shape, function, just not as ornate, you know, very straightforward. Uh, this, the spindles, the balustrades off the uh, stairwell, those are off the shelf available items right now, so those okay. they're not hard to replace uh, at all. What about the handrail? I've noticed this bridge uh, in the top of it. Uh, <coughs> I've seen it before in old places. Would yeah. that have to be? Yeah, have to be. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to redo that. Well, that was fairly, recently, fairly recently lost, too. Right. Uh -huh. We'll probably cut that off, say, you know, just above where it's damaged here, yeah. and, just, and keep this part, yeah. uh -huh. and then just come on down. The hard thing will be to get the color of the finish back. Yeah. But These steps like are in a good shape. Yeah. 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 In fact, we're, re we're reusing all of the treads. We're going to yeah. take them off and replane them yeah. and right. put them back again. <laughs> the Smith had um, an oriental carpet running up it from a huge grandfather's clock. On the lane, the yeah. Was that in one of those photographs? Yeah, yeah, I, I remember seeing that. I think sort of like. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 This, uh, the, oh, yeah. the uh, framing uh, wood that they used in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was probably from a crate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's read that. Not uh, originally for eighty. Or <laughs> the blue decoration that you see is, as you can see, is added because this is the same decoration and no color on it at all. I think yeah. this was added by the temporary residents not too long ago. Now, what about the attic uh, stenciling? When do you think that was done? I don't know, did you, you have some idea on that? Well, yeah. if the Smiths added the um, family room, I would have said they did it. But, uh, well, mean, that might have been when the, Marshall In the 1903 or 04 picture uh -huh. in the A.L. Lassiter scrapbook, mm -hmm. I noted that the the Gable windows were not there. Right. That and are now there. Postcard, and also the the uh, yeah, and the postcard. In the 1911 postcard, you can't see the gable windows. Right. So that's Nor can you see the dormers, which doesn't mean for certain the dormers weren't there, but you, it I is a perspective that looks as well. The end windows it. on uh, was that the 1903 photograph? The end windows in the attic space weren't there either. Yeah. So um, I'm, the Smiths had six kids, and I can see why they would want to you know More have space, a space, space for them yeah. up there. Yeah. So that's. I'm, I'm, I think that's when they would add it. Yeah. You know, it really might not be a very good idea to go upstairs. Uh, we can go up there later on. There's some there's some really bad places in the floor up there. Okay. And uh, we'll end up stepping off of that thing. <laughs> uh, Pat, most of this damage is from what? Exposure to the weather, no heat in it, uh, freezing and thawing. We came water. out here primarily. Water. Uh, we came out here the first frost of last year when we first started documenting this thing in the fall and of course it was pitch black and we had a flashlight and all of the walls glistened oh, because goodness. they had the moisture on them and the frost and it yeah. was really eerie you know but it was interesting it was yeah. uh, it was neat great lesson in the deterioration yeah. the, the micro physics of deterioration with water well i had mentioned earlier that we have a section of the reconstruction called clean up and dry out and we're going to force heat in this thing, regardless of, we know it's going to be in the summertime when we start, but we're going to force heat in this thing and move a lot of air for, say, a couple of weeks yeah. to get, at least get the surface of things dried up. Right. And uh, so we, yeah. The dining room, I think it's pretty common practice that the dining room in a house was often the most elaborate. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, the decorations and things. We're now standing in the dining room. This was, the, yeah, the most. The, uh, what about this uh, ceiling? Uh, decoration here, Pat, the, I call them vines. Right. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the terminology is, but uh, those castings are, again, available off the shelf as a casting. And as you can see in this area, we've got some, we've got some uh, floor joists to replace. So what we're going to have to do is take this ceiling and just cut it right straight across and take all that down. Now, whatever we can reuse and glue back together, we will. What we can't, uh, of course, all of the uh, all of the cornice work and so on, we can keep that. All the molding, I mean, ground molding, we can keep that. And uh, uh, the rest of them will have to veneer plaster yeah. and uh, apply some new molding, probably. Uh, again, using the principle of using original material to save as much wherever as possible can, right. and then filling in. What they do is, for example, all these pieces you see on the floor, and we have called uh, in our clean up and dry out phase that they are, the contractor cannot throw away anything uh, until it's been gone through and mm -hmm. salvaged what we can. But they can take an epoxy 
and put that right back up again, yeah. up onto the new ceiling. Some of this was, uh, yeah, screw Which apply. Was, uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Amazing. I don't know how they did that, really. Some of it, what we kind of reuse, I'd like to see kept and then used maybe in an exhibit on the house and, you know, little pieces, artifacts. Something that you don't really see now is the wood fiber plaster. Yeah. yeah. That's wood fiber. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, here's a piece actually with the screw still on the lab. The plaster mm -hmm. still on the wood lab. Mm -hmm. um, Pat, what about the crown mold in this room, uh, this plaster? Bad. I think, I don't think we have to have any new in here at all, assuming that when, when we put this new part of the ceiling in, it doesn't destroy That's anything. right. We've got a section of the wall over there, as you can see, that's really dropped down that we're having to replace. But I think we can take the uh, uh, molding down first and then be able to put it back up. Right, Jim. If we can't, we can always come back and get us a piece and cast it. Uh, Dick, you were mentioning the, the stenciling before. Uh -huh. Do we have an example of that right under the crown mold yeah, on this wall? That's a really good example. Um, you know, that, that um, molding above the door, I call Greek key molding. Okay, are you, this, yeah. uh -huh. Is this what you're talking about? Yeah. Because I think a great key has like a square end on it. That's mm -hmm. And it's really an Italianate building feature. And um, there's just a possibility it might date back to the um, 1860 house. I mean, I don't mm, know yeah. say anything, but you know, there's a chance that it might. Uh, there are. Because it, it's not the last. examples in Paducah, aren't there? Oh, yeah, a lot yeah, of the Similar style. Well, houses built between like 1860 and 1880 would have had it, right. like that. So. Uh, and it's not there, I mean, there's the house, the rest of the house is classical revival, and there is classical revival molding, but uh, this isn't. So. Like the molding in the lip, in the music room is more mm -hmm. classical than this is. So, uh, they even had pocket doors then, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, I was just. We're taking those down and redoing those. Uh, and they'll still operate as pocket doors. We hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we think they will. Then <laughs> we got the That's. That's in Lower Town in the historic zone. Yeah, they've been closed uh, up. Pocket yeah, doors are a standard item that has to be uh, reworked for the dryer. That's all. Right. Even, even the brand new ones don't work. <laughs> this is the living room? Uh -huh. And did it have a classical column in it? Uh, <laughs> well, the front column in it. Did you put this one in here? Yeah, uh, I Dick and I. I believe Dick, it was you and I. Uh, it was out front and fallen down, and uh, we thought that the wood basically was in pretty good shape. We we'll tried to salvage that, right. and it shouldn't lie out on the ground all winter, so we put it in here. With all the new glues and wood fillers and so on, I think that there's probably a good chance we can uh, put those back together and band them. That again would fit with your principle of original materials wherever possible. Wherever we can. The, the other advantage of that is that. Uh, it would still have the texture that is identical to the other columns. That's you wouldn't right. have an obviously new That's column right. sticking in there. The columns you. themselves would be very easy to replace. I think we talked about that uh, when we were outside, but uh, they'd be very easy to replace as off-the-shelf items, including the decorative capital. But uh, uh, as you said, the texture will be different, and uh, if we can, we're going to glue them all back together. Now, uh, in something like this, where you have uh, a good bit of uh, scaly paint, uh, in preservation, it's not your intention to make it look new, is it? No, no. Uh, first of all, it's almost an impossibility to do. And uh, in preservation work, that's perfectly legitimate, you know, to leave the things that you can't get off, that you would damage the surface of the uh, whatever it is you're taking it off of, and uh, just leave it there and then paint over it again. So we have a lot of that. Yeah, where you have paint that is has a sound bond to the wood or to the brick, um, you would not work and work and work to scrape that off no. for fear of damaging your right. basic material. In fact, yeah. like the exterior brick, for example, there's some paint on those brick that the only way I think you'd ever get them off would be, say, to sandblast it or a yeah. real uh, stiff wire brush. Well, we're not going to let them use that yeah. for fear of damaging the brick. Right. So we'll just leave that on paint over. Sandblasting with yeah. cardinal sin of restoration. Yeah.
that's our program uh, outlining the history and the present condition of the structure of Whitehaven. And I'd like to, at this time, introduce some of the guests that we have with us in the studio to respond to some of your questions and re remind you that the number is 443-0266. And we have people standing by to take down your questions and uh, you can participate in this part of the television program. Uh, to my left is Dick Holland, who is Preservation Director for Growth Incorporated. Uh, and next to him is Bill Black, who is a local contractor. And Pat Kerr, who is the architect uh, dealing with the, the uh, Whitehaven project. Thank you all for being with us. I'd like to come back in a minute and find out why you take more than a professional interest in this project. You were almost like three kids on a, a scavenger hunt watching you go through the old building. I enjoyed that immensely. And to my right is a good friend of mine, Golda Beeman, who is with the uh, William S. Clark Museum. And another friend of mine here at PCC, a professor of history and economics, John Robertson. And Michael Watts, director of the Paducah Art Guild. Michael, I'm glad that you could be with us uh, this evening and uh, uh, add some insights to what Whitehaven is going to be and what it's going to mean to Paducah. Thank you very much. Um, why is this pr restoration project attracting so much attention? What, what makes it unique? I don't know exactly where to start. Let's start with Dick. What, what is the, the, uh, the element or the thing about restoring this uh, house that is uh, attracting so much attention? And do you think the attention will continue to grow? Yeah, I think it's because of all the buildings in this part of the area, it's the house people love the most. I mean, if you ask anybody what their favorite house building is, they probably say the Smith House. And I think it's because it's um, the beauty of it. I mean, it's something that really appeals to people. Um, it's very romantic and reminds some of the past and of the South. And, um, just, it's just everybody's favorite building. Well, thank you. I'd like to find out from John, uh, since you're always uh, advising us and giving us suggestions on to, to what you thought of our program dealing with the history and the present condition and, and sort of getting this uh, uh, project off the ground. It seems to me we have to recognize that one thing that history is, it's continuity with the past. Uh, history is the, the, the cutting edge between the past, the present, and the future. And man, you know, that's about the only thing that really separates us from animals is having a historic past. And the fact that we could not only have one, but participate in it and live in historic terms. I think this is what's unique about this. Here you have a, a project that is being used for a useful function that also preserves the historical interest in it. Um, let, let me go through some of the questions and uh, again remind the viewers at home that uh, you can call in. Call 443-0266. We'll jot down your questions. and. Uh, present them to our panelists. If you want to direct them to any particular person on the panel, uh, just do so, and we'll be glad to. Uh, let's see, Bill, I'll direct this one at you, because I think on the tape you mentioned this, uh, Teresa Underwood called in and said there used to be a stained glass window on the landing with the number uh, 1903 on it, and she was wanting to know what the number meant. Uh, after you talked about it the other day out at the site, have you ever discovered what it was, uh, the significance of that number? Uh, no, I have not. I was surmising at that time that it might be related to the, the World's Fair, which took place in 1903. However, uh, the remodeling of Whitehaven also took place in 1903. Um, so uh, that is pure speculation on my part. I see. Uh, that window, by the way, is still in existence uh, in a restaurant in Grand Rivers, I think. And, um, now, is this um, the panel that this, went at the landing of the stairway? Is that the uh, one yes, you're talking about? Yes, that, that's my understanding. I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard the owner um, uh, mention that she has it and uh, that she purchased it. Well, how much? Uh, in this interim period when the mansion was uh, declining and being vandalized. So probably it was, it was a good fortune for that particular piece of um, craftsmanship. How uh, much of the destroyed. original decor or uh, original contents of the building do you think you'll be able to find and replace? And do you think you'll be able to replace that window? Uh, that, that would be ideal uh, uh -huh. if that could be, if that could take place. Uh, Dick probably is more in touch with, people are beginning to yeah. uh, notify him of artifacts that they have that they're willing to, to contribute. Uh, and in fact, he just acquired one uh, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. We got the, um the mantle back from the music room 
and it's the, it was pro probably the <laughs> nicest man on the house that had scroll work at the very top and across it it read White Haven and a man found it in Atlanta and brought it back and um, we, we have it back now for the mansion and um, I think what will happen is that if we can't get the original pieces back then they'll be duplicated new new material will be duplicated to look like the original but it's always much better to have the original you know that that gives it just a more authentic feeling as, as I sat there and watched the tape I just feel like that uh, uh, you're taking on an awesome project to uh, uh, take the structure in the condition that it is and begin trying to restore it to its uh, uh, previous glory and to be a functional building in, a, in today's society. Uh, Pat, how do you begin? You, you were saying that you were going to take some time to dry it out. Uh, that, I thought that was interesting. What kinds of things do you have to do in order to preserve I this building? Dick, you could have saved me a lot of detailing in the office, a lot of detailing if you had found some of these pieces earlier. <laughs> We've. <laughs> We sort of had to reconstruct them from photographs and from measurements on site. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I would anticipate that if you're talking about decor, uh, you're talking about structural detailing, that we'll end up with about 80% of the original structure there and, and decor, not interior decorator items such as drapes and, and those sorts of things, but certainly the, uh, uh, the crown molding and baseboards, door trim, that sort of thing. I think we'll end up with uh, a good percentage of it back again. We were talking earlier before the show, uh, this question from Paula Rainier, uh, will you allow archaeological excavations on the property? If so, when? Uh, wasn't there some news bill on that this evening? There is. Um, uh, under the direction of Mr. Kit Wessler, staff archaeologist at Murray State University, a professional archaeologist, um, amateur archaeologists, and also uh, members of the public who would be interested in volunteering for to make a contribution of work f toward Whitehaven uh, will have an opportunity to work uh, under his direction uh, in excavations that will be done on the site at um, carefully planned uh, positions around the structure uh, in uh, investigating the history of this as uh, Revealed through through the discipline of archaeology, uh, it's a relatively new uh, perception, at least to the general public, in archaeology, um, in that it's not dealing with prehistoric um, man, but in this case, historic man, um, applying the, the skills uh, that have been well developed in studying prehistoric man. When to, will that get underway? Uh, I don't know exactly when it will get underway, but it. Uh, will take about a month and n really needs to be accomplished before the contractors arrive on the site for the restoration work. So you might work back from then. I, I would say with certainly within a month they would probably be starting. Okay. Um, well, this is, if I may interrupt you, sure. something on this. Uh, <clears throat> we are fairly young as a, uh, a nation and uh, so many other countries have uh, done a lot of archaeological uh, work on relic structures uh, to rebuild uh, the past by using uh, a physical uh, uh, site like this. And uh, I think there's been some interesting work done in Nashville where people began to be aware of their neighborhood. That where did this house come from? Where was, what was the significance? And uh, more of this is needed. Uh, studies like Rick's did in England, for example. Uh, this might be a, a start of a movement where we can uh, tie some of our past to the actual existing structures. Mm -hmm. um, Golda, do you know whether or not the, the finished project uh, will have like a museum in it? Have you heard any discussions as to what will be housed in the structure? Bob, I have heard that there are some plans for a museum and Dick can help me out here with the other planning that uh, we will have. Uh, I believe they want to restore several of the rooms just as they were when the Smiths lived there. Also, where I think the garden clubs may be able to help would be in the garden, in the gardens and trying to get them back as they were or as near as they were. And I would hope that Jerry Smith would uh, 
head that committee because she lived there for so long and she would know and perhaps the Council of Garden Clubs would take that part of it. Uh, for the museum, I think that it would be interesting perhaps to have maybe a Jackson purchase many things in one of the rooms. And Dick, why don't you help me out here as to some of the discussions that you have had with different people? Well, probably the um, two of the downstairs rooms will be fixed up as house museum rooms, you know, to with furniture of the period to show how they were decorated. But the other rooms will be fairly functional, probably with, um, you know, uses for the tourist center. Well, I have a question here. What other, other than the tourist center, will be housed in Whitehaven? For example, will there be an area for community functions? Um, you know, it's nothing's definite yet, but that's, you know, there's a lot of potential use for the upstairs bedrooms, um, meeting rooms, or... Um, well, part of the problem with determining what those spaces are going to be used for is the Federal Highway Administration, certainly because an awful lot of the money is theirs that's going into it, have certain requirements that spaces can be used for. For example, they cannot sell in a tourist center. So, uh, unless there are some waivers at some later dates, the plans are to do a lot of display, such as Kentucky handicraft items, uh, the things that uh, Bill was talking about uh, from the archaeology archaeologist discoveries, there would be a niche there for displaying those things that they found on the site. Uh, I would I would guess that some of the upper rooms would also be used for some meeting spaces, public meeting spaces. But uh, there are some limitations placed on that by the Federal Highway people, and that's why everybody doesn't seem to know what's going to go in there, and, and we're not real sure yet either. But uh, so in, in a large uh, degree. Uh, final decisions haven't been made. As to the use of the individual spaces, that's true, with the exception of the fairly newly constructed area or the area that uh, is most renovated in the rear part of it that will certainly have the restroom facilities, um, uh, uh, lobby type area, drinking fountains, pay telephones, and so on. That will be in the back section of it. I'd like to see an area set aside you know, just on how the house was restored with before and after pictures and let people appreciate the, you know, the I'm amazing we can do task. Some of that with television right. too. Uh, what if I might interrupt. I'd like to say that with as much space as the house is going to have when it is completed, but I certainly would hope that there would be some way for displays of uh, artifacts and different things for this area. It's just, uh, it would add, I think, to it being a tourist center for uh, people to stop and want to see it. Michael, do you think that the uh, the Art Guild will be involved in any way in the interior design committee structure and uh, and the displays that are put in there? I don't know if they will be. I don't know if they'd like to be. <laughs> put it that way. It's interesting that Gold's bring this up about the displays. I think that that's partly what Whitehaven can offer that the traditional Tour center can't offer. And the other important thing to me is that people can see a historic structure like Whitehaven being used in the museum sense, which is what most people think of a historic structure's use being, but also in a real active day to day, you know, uh, used facility. That it's not just something where you go and see things and you talk and whisper and you walk very softly and all that, that you really can use these structures. Right. Older structures can be readapted to suit modern functions and still maintain the historic character and the, the aesthetic beauty that they have inherent and give us that tie to the past that John was talking about earlier. I think that's really a key to why this whole thing should work. <laughs> I have another question here. Uh, will, will you restore any of the other buildings on the grounds behind the main structure? Uh, Bill, who wants to there. respond to that? As an architect, I won't. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the plans are now that the ramping parking area uh, and all of the supporting facilities, there will be some picnic areas and some seating areas, uh, pretty much takes up the rest of the site. How much space is there? Uh, right at 10 acres, I think. Uh, the, uh, there has been some conversations related to the only building that you can actually see on the site from, the I, from I-24, which is a one-story structure. Uh, as to perhaps that might be safe, but if not, it will be dismantled carefully and the bricks were used in areas of the, uh, of the structure itself where we don't have enough brick and we need to match it in texture. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, but that old well house will be restored. Mm -hmm. That's on the side oh, of it. Under a gazebo. Yeah, right. a gazebo area. Uh, uh, callers has called in and said you mentioned a large garden area uh, with extensive landscaping. Will extensive landscaping landscaping take place when you restore the uh, the structure? And also, will there be offices for the tourist center, such as downtown, the tourist the tourist commission? Will those offices perhaps be housed in the center? There, there's office space for that. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they will or not, I don't know. Landscaping wise, what about the garden. Uh, Landscaping-wise, that is not a part of the contract, and as Golden mentioned, we would hope that that is a community involvement thing that we would really ask for. Uh, there's very little left out there now in the way of uh, ornamentals and so on. That leads to something that you mentioned earlier on the tape about the committees. Yeah, I wanted to get into mm -hmm. that too. How will they be formed? Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Who will appoint the them? Where do they come from? Are they going to do I don't have the vaguest notion. <laughs> I. Uh, I'm sort of mimicking some of the things that I've been told. Uh, how they'll be formed, who'll be on them, who's in charge of them. I'm not really too sure. Uh, up to this point, uh, had very little input, you know, to the function of the structure or or any directions, other than put it back like it was. And uh, Dick, do you have any ideas of how uh, how much involved the local community will be in? Uh, in working with the restoration well, I think, project. I think it'll be left to local, to Paducah, the people of Paducah, McCracken County and the area to furnish the house to, um, I mean, I think basically they'll restore the house and then they'll be left up to us to um, do the Organize rest. ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And like the house has the extensive stenciling in it, you know, that um, dates back to about 1903. And I mean, there could certainly be a community project to restore the stenciling, you know, to um, find a way to bring that back after the restoration. Dick, you mentioned uh, just the other day when we were out there a uh, need to document mm -hmm. those stenciling designs. Yeah. Every uh, room has a different type of stencil, you know, used. Is it covered over now um, in places? I, I just remember seeing <coughs> bits Yeah, and most of it's covered over with wallpaper, but as the house is deteriorated, the wallpaper is peeled off so you can see it. So um, there's a lot. And then there's one, some areas where there's two layers of stenciling. There's the original stenciling, then there's a layer later level so um, it's, it's fascinating. Michael what's what's the technique of, of stenciling or the uh, the reason for doing it do you well, know? Well it's a pretty standard practice around the turn of the century for decoration. Um, I don't know if it was used because it was cheap in wallpaper just an additional decoration but it's it's the same technique that any school child learns or if you had one of the rulers with the alphabet down the middle it's simply a, uh, usually a paper stencil I think was used you just put it up there and you trace it off. You could paint over it, paint through it. So that's all we'd have to do is to reproduce the pattern yeah. and, you know, find the proper paints. Now, uh, as I understand that, there is nothing in the contract to, uh, for providing for recording um, the, these patterns. That's correct. So this would be a very appropriate project for an interesting interested citizen to volunteer for someone who has time running short to document yeah. that, by the way. Too. That's right, because once the construction starts, uh, uh, it will be very difficult to justify any waste of time. Uh, and here will go to so right to, now, uh, to do rubbings uh, of uh, various monuments and that sort of thing. Looks like somebody could take the time to copy a stencil. That would be a, 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 a volunteer who is needed immediately. <laughs> Well, since those, com those stencils were commercially produced, aren't there pattern books that would, you could maybe just thumb through and find one? There may perhaps be, uh, but we would need documentation as to what we had here. Yeah. In other words, uh, photographic Measure evidence. But um, on all, we have, we've seen a lot of pictures A.L. Laster took of buildings he designed, and he used stenciling throughout them, so um, I'm sure he, he's the one that had it put up. And then um, probably when the Smiths had the house redone by Marshall Fields, they covered it with the um, wallpaper. Have you contacted Marshall Fields? No, that's a, it would be a good source, though. When I was working in that, that museum in Montana, they had done the interior decoration, and they don't have all the records, but if, with the photographs you've got, and if you could send copies to them, they know what they had mm -hmm. available mm -hmm. then. They might be able to really help a lot with the period restoration for those rooms you're talking about. Okay. Well, I'd like to bring up a point. We've been talking about public involvement and the archaeological dig and so forth. Uh, I would like to ask people to stay away from the structure. Uh, we have 
<laughs> we've tried to get the Department of Transportation to. There's still souvenir hunters, uh, uh, some vandalism still being done. I think more the more publicity the thing gets, the more people it brings out. And uh, I I live in the subdivision there by uh, Whitehaven, and I've run several people out. <laughs> I've also asked the Paducah Police Department to look after it, and they've done a very good job. I see them out there all the time. Uh, but until construction can actually start, it's really not safe on the interior, especially. I noticed that you were reluctant <laughs> to go upstairs. That's right. So, <laughs> so I'd like to relay that message to the public to please, please stay away from it uh, for their own good and for historic sake, too. Well, and besides that, I hear the front columns are full of bees right now. That's exactly right. <laughs> You're going to have your hands full of bees. <laughs> Uh, a question just came in from Mickey Land. I want to know the size of the house, the square feet, and the number of rooms. Pat? The basic house, the 1860 house, is 40 by 50, two stories high, with some attic space. You know, so we're talking about 4,000 square feet. It has eight rooms plus a center hall, which really on the upper level is a room too. Now that's the original, the original house. Uh, Dickie might be able to tell you at what dates. We haven't determined yet. There was about three different editions and rooms added as well as the uh, uh, port of shear on the side. So Dickie may be I'm guessing there. that the kitchen part might be date to the 1860s too because it, they always built their kitchen separate in case they caught on fire the rest of the house wouldn't burn. And then I feel the later um, owners probably just enclosed a space between the kitchen and the house and built dining rooms and pantries in there. Then the Smiths added several bedrooms um, on the back, and the Smiths added the carport on the side also. So um, now I always hear 20 rooms in the house. That's what. There's I'm actually saying. only at the very most 6,000 square feet total. Uh, yeah, it's a very it's a small structure. The uh, it's a large structure. It has very small spaces in it. You know, the uh, it looks like it'd be larger than that on the inside. But it's mm -hmm. John, by going through the the process of of restoring and renovating this house and perhaps by involving community support in the committees. Um, how will we be benefited, benefiting future generations? I just, I guess what's triggered this question was the when you pulled the wallpaper off, Dickie, and there was the stenciling under it, then what sort of things will we perhaps find uh, about the people who built this house? I think we'll be learning more about ourselves as we progress. And uh, not only that, but having uh, what you're doing here, the, uh, the record of the progress of mm -hmm. restoration, this can be a model for others mm -hmm. to follow in similar projects. And uh, this is something I think the, uh, the bulldozer age may be past. We were to where, you know, uh, an old structure, we tore it down and we built a square box with glass. Uh, that is seemingly, uh, uh, we are wanting to do something with the older, to use it and to experience perhaps uh, what they experienced at the same time, use it in our own lives. That may be what we're get from, getting from this project. I hope the house will serve as inspiration to people too, to show them that it's never too late to save a building. Because, I mean, a year ago, Everybody was saying, well, I mean, you might as well tear it down. It can't be saved. I try. And, uh, and we've shown it only, can be. Only a month before the governor's news conference here, um, several of us uh, here in this room had gotten together uh, hoping to persuade Paducah Community College not to demolish the building. And, uh, and they were very open um, to not demolishing it. And in fact, they were open to the idea of stabilizing it uh, to hold off further deterioration in hopes that perhaps within a decade some unforeseen use might occur um, that would allow this structure um, to not be lost uh, to the community of Western Kentucky. And um, within a month, Governor Brown uh, made his suggestion uh, down here and uh, about the tourist information center and uh, it, we, we never ex expected it to be <laughs> that quick. That quick. No. Part, of the, part of the significance, too, is the fact that it was cheaper to restore the building yes. than, than to build a new structure, which this is, architecturally couldn't match it. It's the most practical thing to do. Right. This is what, uh, the genius of uh, present-day historic preservation uh, is 
uh, that it it uh, doesn't put history on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, it integrates it into our lives. Uh, it uh, there is a great hunger for heritage uh, in our country right now, and those communities uh, that make provision for protecting their their physical building heritage um, will uh, benefit a decade from now uh, when the that those her that heritage is lost from other communities that make no provision to protect it. Uh, we rarely appreciate the antiques we grow up with, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we appreciate them the generation after we've lost them. Well, this project and what we're doing downtown and in Lower Town on Jefferson Street, I think it really makes Paducah a leader in the historic preservation movement in the country. And this is probably, to me, I, this is probably the most exciting project going on now in the United States. The, the unique point about this uh, Whitehaven structure, though, is that all of Western Kentucky identifies with this oh, yeah. building. Mm -hmm. I've heard, it's so prominent. From, I mean, yes, I've had people from uh, all over Western Kentucky ask me, um, uh, why don't you do something with that building up there? Uh, and uh, if people heard that I was interested in historic preservation, they would always say, there is a certain building up there <laughs> that on Highway 45, and of course, well, in the last few minutes, let me get through the remaining questions that someone called in and said, I've always heard there was a grand piano on the third floor. Is it still there? No. No? That's the one that was. That has been identified, has it not? And it's going to be it's restored? In, mm -hmm. It's in New Orleans now, and the lady um, came and spoke to us, and she's wanting to lend it back as a, um, to be On permanent basis. Mm -hmm. Do they have to cut a hole in the ceiling to get it up there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're going to put it behind the first floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have to cut a hole in the basement? <laughs> 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 Did you tell us exactly where on the first floor? <laughs> 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 you have to make a build <laughs> Someone else called in and said if they're interested, how does one go about donating furnishings of the area, era of the 1900s or whatever? What exactly when are you going to put it back to be representative of? Uh, well, I think it's up to the Department of Transportation really to um, set that the criteria how, in the committee. How does the structure mm -hmm. work? Who really, how does the line of authority go on? The All right. I mean, who sets policy? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the organization that's being left up to the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not in the contract, as I understand. The contract is to restore the building, uh, but not to I'd like to direct the question to Pat. Okay. Uh, you said there would not be any gifts sold or you couldn't sell in a tourist center. Well, what, how do you go about? I think we have so many lovely things in Kentucky, made in Kentucky. I'm not speaking about McCracken County or Paducah. I'm speaking of Kentucky-made things. And I think we're missing a great, uh, uh, missing an opportunity here to uh, let people know what we have in Kentucky. Uh, <coughs> Where would you go with this? I think Secretary Metz would love me to tell you this and so would Commissioner Huff but I would say that a letter to them would not hurt anything although they are controlled by the Federal Highway Administration sure. they're the ones who are setting the criteria I think it probably gives some impetus to perhaps getting a waiver mm -hmm. but I you know I would say that'd be a good idea there's so much room and it needs to be utilized and when people stop there I think all of Kentucky is missing the great opportunity well, I wanted to clarify one thing that it's a big misconception now about the restoration of the house. The picture in the paper made it appear that the front porch wasn't, they weren't going to retain the round portion of the front porch. But, <coughs> and we definitely are. The um, original porch will be there. It'll just be repaired. And the picture in the paper was a straight on elevation that didn't show dimension really. Well, so um, the, the porch will, exact, will, will look exactly the way it does now. I hope that this is just the first in a series of programs that we're <laughs> able to do on the restoration as it progresses. And Bill, uh, Pat, uh, Dick, I wish you uh, good luck on your, your summer's work and uh, year's work in doing this job. They Go certainly have their work. Cut out, Bob. <laughs> Michael, thank you all for being with us this evening and, and responding to the viewers' questions and those of you that called. Thank you for calling, and to the Kentucky Humanities Council, thank you for making this all possible.